right, Mikara. Okay, just making sure everyone can hear me, Cyrilla. Uh, am I audible? Yes, perfect. Go ahead. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon to everyone and welcome to those who have joined us for this webinar on small business development brought to you by the Arya Samaj Women's Forum. I'm Mikara Maharaj, an executive member of the Women's Forum. The rate of unemployment has risen since the introduction of lockdown to control the spread of COVID infections. In addition, the widespread looting in KZN during J July resulted in the non-recovery and closure of many businesses. These events have rendered many women unemployed and without income to sustain their homes. The Arya Samaj Women's Forum is deeply concerned about the plight of these women and have decided to invite a well-known entrepreneur and women empowerment advocate, Mrs. Margaret Hirsch, to offer strategies and help women get their business started to generate their own income. So here's a short background about Margaret. Margaret Hirsch is the executive director of, Ho of Hirsch's Home Stores and the largest independently owned appliance, electronics, and home furnishing retail outlet in Southern Africa that is now in its 42nd year. For many years, she has been involved with women and youth empowerment projects throughout Southern Africa. She personally visits schools around the country motivating, encouraging, and inspiring the youth. Margaret is passionate, passionate about women in business and entrepreneurship. She runs virtual networking clubs for women in business, entrepreneurs, and the property sector. A recipient of many international and local awards for her business, social, and charitable work, Margaret is a proud South African and believes in the future of the country and the African continent in general. On behalf of the Arya Samaj Women's Forum and our chairperson, Dr. Sirela Ramplas, I extend a warm welcome to Margaret and invite her to share her valuable knowledge and experience with us. As Margaret takes us through her presentation, you may write your questions in the chat box. These will be addressed in the Q&A session following the presentation. Uh, Margaret, welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you so much and thank you for inviting me today and I really my absolute passion is women and women entrepreneurs so I'm so happy to have so many here. Shall I just carry awesome. on? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, perfect. You can start your, your presentation. So, thank you. So my aim is to have every woman financially independent because a financially independent woman has choices. She can leave if she's not happy where she is, she can leave. She can take her children with her. She doesn't have to worry about maintenance and all that type of thing. She goes, she's financially independent. She can go wherever she wants, do whatever she wants. She can educate her children. She can feed them and she can house them. That is what it is to be financially independent and a financially independent woman. It is so important that every woman becomes financially independent. But how do you do that? Well, well, you know, the first thing you have to know is that you can do it. I've done it and you can do it too. And whatever I tell you is not to impress you, but to impress upon you that if I can do it, you can do it. You see, I come from very, very poor people. My, my father died when I was 10. My mother was left in a world that she couldn't cope. She didn't know what to do, where to go. She worked in Ninian and Leicester as an invoice typist for 30 rand a month. And that's what we lived on. I was put into a foster home, Loop Street, Peter Maritzburg, and she came to Durban to get a job and it took a while for her to get me back again so that we could live together as a family. And we lived in the back room of a, a little house in Rosetta Road in Durban. So it's not as if I came from wealthy people or came from anybody. We came from absolutely nowhere. And then I met my husband in, in way back in 1971, married him in 1972. So we married nearly 50 years already. And um, my husband wasn't also, he didn't come from wealthy people. He came from really hardworking poor people. And he never ever passed standard seven because he was dyslexic and he didn't know it then. They just told him he was stupid and he couldn't pass his standards. So he started working with his hands. So there we were two very ordinary people from very, very humble backgrounds, got together, got married, and we started our life now we could have just decided to stay in that life we could have battled and struggled our whole life but I had decided long ago that there had to be a different kind of life and I think that's where it comes to it's a decision it's not something that just happens you have to actually physically decide that you don't want the life that you're in and women who are in a situation that they don't want to be in you need to decide that you're not going to stay there any longer and so we started off and um 
we had absolutely nothing to go on. And do you think it couldn't get worse? It got worse because as soon as I got pregnant, my boss fired me. So then I had no job. And my husband was an apprentice earning 25 rand a week when we got married. So it wasn't as if we had could afford to lose my job as well, but we did. Now, we, there again, we could have just stayed in that and, and sickled in poverty for the rest of our life. But we decided that we, we wanted a better life. We decided we would do more. And so we started our own business. Now, that was way back when, when nobody knew about about entrepreneurs nobody knew how to start a business least of all us we didn't have any business degrees or anything like that but we just decided that we would do it ourselves because I vowed I would never work for a boss again and I never have and my husband didn't get on with his boss so he left so we went from having two jobs and no children to having two children and no jobs in the space of just over a year so that was our incentive to get on and get stuck in and get working so we started our first little shop which Shane's going to show you now hopefully um, and at 169 of Schlanger Rocks Drive, we only did repairs. That's all we did is we did repairs to appliances. And it was a, we called it the Appliance Hospital. And we started off just fixing mostly air conditioners. It was February we started in Durban, which, as you know, is very hot. And so we started fixing air conditioners. And one thing led to another, we fixed washing machines and fridges. And we never sold anything. We didn't know how to sell. But to people, sometimes people's machines were really, really broken. So we would start selling appliances. And our shop was so small and sometimes we had to put them on the pavement there wasn't even room for them inside but I, at that stage I started teaching microwave cooking and it had nowhere to put the stuff so we used to put everything on the pavement and I would start cooking in this tiny little shop that was probably as big as your toilet and we would that's how we started but luckily a building came free down the road and we were tired of paying rent to a landlord. So we decided to buy the building. Now we had no money. So we went to the bank and we borrowed money from the bank. And that was when we opened our second shop, which was 27 Amshonga Rocks Drive. We bought that property for a couple of hundred thousand, and uh, which was much more money than we ever had. We borrowed the money and we paid it off quickly. And that's how we started our whole property business from just a really humble beginnings like that. So the shop was downstairs and I had the cookery school upstairs where I taught people how to cook in the microwave oven. And in those days, people didn't know what a microwave oven was, and they sure as hell didn't know how to cook in it. But that was, you know, it's a long story, and that's how we went along, and that's how we came along. And we just, we worked very hard, and we opened another branch in town. Those who remember in Broad Street, we had a shop in Broad Street. We had, um, we then bought Nero and Gore when they closed down in Pine Town. And so we went along, we bought different shops along the way. And so we had a whole lot of shops. And today, we, I'm very proud to tell you, we have 24 shops around the country. We own them all, they all paid for. And we, that's just how we started our business from very humble beginnings, just one shop at a time, one by one by one, they built up. And we also own the Samsung stores that are in um, Gateway, Pavilion, Mall of Africa, Santon, and Constantia Village in Cape Town. So those are in shopping centers. So we don't own those ones. We rent them from the shopping centers, but they're very, very state of art. And then we started last year, actually this year, the, the one and only standalone speak store in the whole world. We started in Constantia Village Mall. And don't think life is easy because the mall burnt down last week. But luckily, we managed to salvage our shop and the 1.3 million rand fridge which is in it that fancy fridge there costs 1.3 million rand so um but we managed to salvage that and you'll hear as we go along the way all sorts of things happen to us but we just carry on regardless so but the big turning point in our business was in 1994 and those of you who remember that was the year Nelson Mandela came out of jail and we didn't know what was going to happen to the country so what we did is we decided that we wouldn't keep our whole business for ourselves but we would fragment it and we would sell all the trucks to the drivers and start them in their own businesses we sold our buckies to our technicians started them in their own businesses we had gas installers we had air conditioning installers. We had technicians who fixed fridges and stoves and washing machines. And we started them all. We started about 32 businesses in that year. And I'm so pleased to tell you that now, 25 odd years later, those businesses are still going because of the formula that we used to set them up. Now, what was the formula we used to set them up? The formula was that the man would do the work. For example, he would drive the truck, but the woman would stay at home and she would control the money. And the technician would go out and fix their appliances, but the woman would stay home and she would collect the money. Now, why do you think that in a country where the divorce rate is about 73%, 
all those couples are still married. Well, it's a very, very simple formula. The woman holds the money. You see, while the woman is holding the money, the man is not going anywhere. As soon as the man's holding the money, he's running off with some floozy somewhere, and then the whole situation breaks down. So that's a very, very good lesson to all of you. If you want to get ahead, you hold the money, and you give your husband an allowance. But if he takes the money and gives you the allowance, you're going to end up on the back foot. So that's my very good advice to all of you. And then we went along and everything was going swimmingly. All our branches were doing so well. And then COVID struck. And if you thought COVID wasn't bad enough, the looting struck. And they looted our stores and they took out absolutely everything. 20 years worth of business went straight down the toilet in literally a few minutes when they broke into the stores. They not only broke into the stores, but they set fire to the store. And setting fire to the store made the biggest mess of all because it blew all the windows out. You'll see it melted all our tiles and um, it directed everything. Even took all my husband's cricket bats from me that he had that was worth a fortune. Oh. I don't know if you can uh, be a host and just mute the person who's on there who isn't muted. And so, yeah, so you think that, you know, it's never going to happen, but it happened to us. So they took everything out of our store. They wrecked everything. They broke everything. It was a real, real mess. And, you know, when, when something like that happens, the only thing you can do is forgive. And when you see me there, I said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And that says that in the Bible, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I had to sit and I had to forgive all those people who came in and wrecked my store. And from that, I got the courage to start off all over again. Now, everybody said they were only going to build later and it was going to take a year to 18 months to get it right. But our first thing I did is took all the rubbish out. You see the pile of all the rubbish there. And we couldn't get people to to work with us so we had to just use our own people who worked in our store so our manager became the tiler the store people became the painters my cashiers were painting everybody got stuck in and in nine days we got that store up and running again so those of you who've seen the buildings around us that are still broken it's within yourself that you have the inner strength that you need and god will never give you anything that you can't handle. So you've got to know whatever he gives you, you can handle it. And I said, God, you've given me a challenge here, but I'm going to show you that I can rise to this challenge. And I will not take two years to fix my store up. I fixed it up in nine days. And nine days later, there I am in exactly the same store that you saw in the two slides previously, from absolutely broken to completely retiled, repainted, new windows and new stock in in nine days i did that so and by doing that i proved to other people that they could do it so straight after that food lovers market opened next to me tile africa opened up macro still isn't open but they were going to open two years later but now they're hoping to open later in the month so it just goes to show if you go ahead and do something, you, you show other people that they can do it too. And that was the object of my exercise there, that I knew that I could do it. See, a woman's like a diamond. She only reaches her full potential under pressure. And it's that pressure that pushes you to, pushes you to make yourself so strong that you can go ahead and you can do anything that you want in life. And you find that in your life, you can do that. So there we are. And there's our staff that were with, working with us. You see, they've got their blue jeans on. They've been scrubbing. They've been cleaning they've been painting the biggest mess was from the fire that was a real mess the soot just kept coming down 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 and we just kept cleaning 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 until we got it clean and there we all we started up so we managed to save all those jobs and we managed to start the store and it's gone now from strength to strength it's doing figures that we never ever thought we could do and we really want to thank the community who came down and helped us to take all the rubbish out to clean it up and to get it up and running again so that's that's in the stores and we're very very strong our company's going extremely well but i do do a lot of other work as well so i work in the schools i love children and i love school children and I don't believe in our education department and what they do and what they teach our children. So I go into the schools and here you see me teaching the girls about their bodies. So I've got my uterus and my ovaries drawn on my apron there and I explain to them how their bodies work. I work with a super guy called Steve Schwartz and you see he's taken the boys to the other side there and he explains to them how to treat a woman with dignity, how women are precious beings and they should be treated with all the respect that they deserve. I teach the girls how to try and not get pregnant too 
soon and to save their bodies for later and to only um, have sex when they want to have children when, they, when they're older. And I give them reusable sanitary pads because I was shocked when I was uh, 62, I discovered that out of the 7 million school girls in this country, more than 40% don't go to school for four weeks of the month. They stay at home when they get their periods because they have no sanitary protection. So with my friend Sue Barnes, who's a fashion designer by profession, we manufacture reusable sanitary pads for the girls. And I take them into the schools and I give them a little pack of one pair of panties, because a lot of them haven't even got panties, and three pads, one on, one off, one in the wash with a little plastic container to put the dirty ones in so they can take them home and wash them. And they wash them at night like they wash their brookies, hang them up, they can use them the next day. And they last for five years. So I give them out in grade eight, which is the old fashioned standard six, and they last until grade 12 when they finish school. And they can go to school every single day because of that. So that's one way. But I work, when I work in the schools, I'm horrified to see the condition of some of the schools. Now, this particular one that I went to in Komashu, um, there were 700 students and 43 teachers, and they only had two taps and not one toilet in the whole place. So I just said, this is just not right. You can't do this. So we built them um, 19 toilets and 16 wash hand basins. And the principal who's there in the picture said to me, she said, you've given me back my dignity because uh, you have no idea what it was like to come to school and not be able to go to learn in privacy. It was awful. So little, little things that we take for granted are huge and other people's lives and it's up to us as women to go and help other women especially those who are educating the children because that's what we need to do those children are our future but having said that one of my friends is Marianne Wundler now you might ask who's Marianne Wundler she was Nelson Mandela's chef when he was in office and when he retired she retired and I found her living in Amlazi and I said to her Marianne you're too good to be retired and being in Amlazi so what we did is we started a school for um, ladies who had no education and we take them out of the townships and we teach them not only to cook, but how to make a living from cooking. So that all of these women, now they're specialized. Every day you, you people start new businesses. You've got to specialize. People want people who specialize in things. So we specialized in funerals. So when the person died, and um, we would come in with a whole bunch of ladies and we would look after the bereaved family who were too distraught to look after themselves. But their relations would come from far and wide. They would come to the home and we would cook for them and it would culminate in a big funeral on the Saturday. And these ladies would cook and they would obviously charge for it and the people would pay them for their cooking. And I'm so pleased to tell you that um, the year before COVID, I had 800 women through my school and every one of them today is still working and making a living from cooking and because they know how to cook and they know how to work out the finances and make a living from cooking. So then about four or five years ago, I was sitting in my branch in Brackpan when a lady came running in. She said, Margaret, I'm tired of being poor. I cannot do this anymore. I've been poor my whole life. I'm sick of it. I'm 56 years old and I don't want to be poor no more. So I said to her, what do you do? She said, well, I buy and sell old clothes for a living. So I said, well, that's a horrible job. What do you like doing? She said, I'd love to bake. If I could just bake, I would be in heaven. So there we baked and we taught her to bake and she, she asked the cakes and she was much better than me at icing the cakes. And then so I said, okay, what you do now, we get another four ladies. I've taught you. You've got to get four ladies, but teach them. So we got four ladies, we taught them. And in turn, they got four ladies and taught them. And so it's gone on. Um, the lady that you see on the extreme left here, she is our latest student, and that's Mary and um, that's her, Anna the Baker, Anna's behind me there. And that was she made that cake within about three weeks of being taught. She's now gone on to make another massive cake for which she's got lots and lots of money. So everybody has something amazing inside of them and you've got to know what's holding you back from letting it all out it's so important that you know that you've got greatness inside you and that you can you just need somebody to give you the right expression but why i love teaching women is that if you teach a woman she'll teach her children now that little boy had a very bad work ethic he was sitting at home with his mother and she didn't work we brought her in we taught her to bake we taught her to sell the cakes and they do sell the cakes. That's how they make a living. And now he has a good work ethic. He's proud of his mother. He knows how to go and get the ingredients. He knows how to come home and bake and he knows how to, to, to sell the cakes. And all of these, by the way, start slowly. We started with one cake. 
We baked one cake, it cost us 30 rand for the ingredients, we sold it for 60 rand. It was a 60 rand, we took it and we bought, we baked two cakes, we sold them for 120 rand. We took the 120 rand, we baked four cakes, we sold them for 240 rand. And that's how you build up slowly but surely. That's the formula I use, and it doesn't matter what business you're in. If you use that formula, it works every time, and you will make a lot of money. Anna, who started with me, and now owns a home in Somerset West and she drives a Mercedes Benz and she's got a double cam bucky as well. So your mission in life is to find your purpose and your purpose in life is to give it away. One of my best friends just lost both her children to suicide recently. Now, why would they commit suicide aged 47 years old? Because they didn't have a purpose in their life. If you have a purpose in your life, you know why you get up every day. If you have no purpose in your life, you don't even want to live. That's how bad it is. It's so important that you find. So that's the cake my student built, um, baked after only three weeks, three weeks before she baked this cake. She'd never not only baked a cake, she'd never asked a cake in her life. And she managed to bake that cake for a wedding two weeks ago, um, all by herself. I didn't show her how to do it. She just did it all by herself. It's a little bit higgledy-piggledy, and I must be honest, I could have improved upon it, but she did it, and the bride and groom were extremely happy with the cake that she baked for them. So it just goes to show all that was inside her, but she didn't even know it. So I also own Johannesburg School for the Blind, where most of the children are burnt and, and they're blind. And so we have a piano where we teach them to play and to sing and to utilize all the other faculties that they have that they can't see because they can't see. But we also teach Braille in the school as well. And um, yeah, it's, it's quite hectic. It's been quite a rough area. We have a lot of burglaries, but we soldier on and we carry on and we look after those children. I was also horrified to find out that a lot of girls who go to Johannesburg to uh, work um, don't have food and accommodation. So they get what's called a bless blesser. And the blesser is a man who will give them food and accommodation in exchange for sex. So I was horrified to hear this and I thought this cannot continue. So with that, I started, I bought a 17 bedroom house in um, Joburg. Uh, right near UJ, and I started a home for girls. I ended up for my sins having three boys living there as well, but they're very, very good boys. They look after the girls, and they can come and they can stay with me until they get on their feet and get up and running. But I do make them work. I don't let them just sit around doing nothing. They've got to go and find a job. First month, they save their first month's deposit. They save their first month's rent, and they save for their lots of water. And after that, they've got to pay, and it works incredibly well. So that's what, that's what I have so to, to look after the girls who need, who need to go and work in Joburg. You see, you can have everything in life that you want if you help enough people to get what they want. So if you haven't got everything you want, you're just not helping enough people to get what they want. So I'm very blessed to be able to have everything that I want in life, but I do help other people all the time. Also, I run a, an orphanage in Isipingo. This is me with my team going to the Lady Snay. Snay is the lady with her arm in the air. She has 45 abandoned children that she looks after in Isipingo in a little house that she built herself with her own two hands. So in the middle of COVID, um, she got thrown out of where she was living. She had all these children and she went and built herself her own little house in the middle of nowhere. When I tell you, it's really in the middle of nowhere. It's in this pingo. And uh, she has these little children dropped off with her. I was with her one day when somebody dropped a two-week-old baby. They just came. So I've got this baby. I'm sick. I'm going to hospital. The mother went to hospital. She never came back. She never gave her name. She never gave the child's name. But Snay is just amazing because she keeps all these children. She feeds them. And she just says, God will look after her. But she also teaches them. She homeschools them because she, that's just the way she is. She teaches them about, the, you see, the birds, about the earth, about Africa, about the alphabet about shapes and she teaches these kids every single day she doesn't get paid for it nobody pays her and I just give her food so that she can feed these children every day because they are just she's amazing and the children are just amazing but I work with a lot of different people there's uh, my fabulous team that Shane who's on here today um, putting the slides up my friend Glenda who's a journalist and this is one of the schools that we look after in Kumashu so um, we go out and once a month I try and go in and there's the toilets that I built for them um, that the children now can use a proper toilet, they know how to flush, they know how it works and they can go forward in their life and at least they won't have to be going in the bush all the time. 
So it's just amazing um, what a little bit of money can do. I've also this year been very blessed to work with all the Mrs. South Africans. So these are the Mrs. South Africa. There's Tenjiwi, who's our reigning Mrs. South Africa in the middle next to me. And my friend, Somia Gautam, who is the reigning Mrs. India South Africa, who's next to her. So it started with 125 women, then down to 100, then to 75. And now we're on the final 25. And if you follow me on Facebook, you'll see me next Friday, where we crown the next Mrs. South Africa for 2022 so i'm very excited for that i've got a beautiful dress as well um very heavy weighs 11 kilos so be the woman who fixes another queen's crown without telling the world it's crooked you know i think as women we've got to be the woman who just goes behind the scenes and helps people and helps them to get to where they want to be because at the end of the day that's how you become successful and how you can have a better life so um this year with the Mrs. South Africa, um, what I decided to do was to give a matric dance to a school where they would never be able to afford to have a matric dance. So we found a school in Dipslut, which is outside Four Ways in Joburg. And I worked with one of the Mrs. South Africa finalists named Mpo. And she, we gathered together, I asked our friends for some dresses. We wanted about 100 dresses. We ended up with 500 dresses. We ended up with all our husband's old suits and shoes. And you'll see those wonderful guys there. Those shoes were too big for them, but they just wore three pairs of socks. And off they came to the dance in those amazing suits and the amazing dresses. So we had the best time ever. And um, there we are with the Mrs. South Africa finalists. We're singing, we're dancing at the school. And then we dressed all the girls. We did their makeup and we, they had the best time you've ever had. Um, with the other dresses, we needed money, obviously, to um, pay for all the, the party. So that's my staff and the other Mrs. South Africa finalists modeling some of the dresses that were donated to us. And we sold them all, and for that we money we got the money to to have the whole party, the whole dance, and they all had two hundred and ten matrix had the best best night ever, um, and can you believe those? Um, Below there are all the school girls. I had the Mr. South Africa finalists helping me, but those are the school girls there who came in looking like little girls from school and came out looking like amazing ladies. It was just too incredible for words. So there's all the, some of the other matrix at the matric dance and us um, who helped to get them all ready. We stuck on for our sons 100 pairs of false eyelashes that night. Yeah, that's not something we ever want to do again in our life, but that was just amazing. So there you go. And, you know, you can have it all. You can have a loving husband. You can have children. You can have a family and a full-time career. It is possible. And you can still have time to give back. If you use your time wisely, you don't want to spend your life watching television and watching days of other people's lives. You need to be the one who's going out and um, making it happen. So for me and my family is the most important thing in my life. I'm very blessed to be married to my husband, as I told you, for nearly 50 years. Um, you can go up one, uh, Shane. So this is my family that I'm very, very um, proud of. And Shane is going to come up just now. He's going to put up the picture, which I don't know why it isn't coming up. I'm, I think there's a lag somewhere. Oh, there we are. It has come. It's behind there, Shane. I think you've got it in duplicate somehow. But my mom is still alive. She's 96 years old. And um, she is just still as bright and as vibrant as ever. Um, I've um, yeah, Shane is not working. This other slide seems to have stuck. I don't know if you girls can all see it on the on the other side. Oh yeah, maybe you can. Uh, so there's my mom, who's 96, my husband, my son and his wife. Um, my son's 45, my daughter's 43 and her husband. And I've got five little grandsons coming up through the ranks. So I'm very, very blessed to have all of those. Um, so, you know, you, I always say, this is Dr. Sears says, you have brains in your head, you've got feet in your shoes, you can steer yourself any direction you choose, you know who you know you are. You are who you are, you know who you are, and you're the one who decides where you'll go. It's really important to make a decision of where you want to go in your life. I know where I wanted to go. I knew that I wanted to have everything that I wanted in my life, and I do have it today. It took a lot of hard work, and it took a long time, but I got there in the end. Now, where do you start? You start with writing your goals down. So if I had to say to you, what's the most important thing in your life? Well, the most important thing is your health, and COVID's taught us that, because if, if you don't have your health, you don't have anything. Now, both these ladies are 74 years old. Which one do you want to be? Now, the next question is, 
when do you think they started looking like this? Do you think they started at 74 or do you think they started when they were your age? And the answer is they started when, you, when they were your age. If you don't exercise and you don't eat properly, you'll end up old and decrepit. You don't want to be like that. You want to still have a young, vibrant life. You know, they say the children today are going to live till they're 200. They say all of us are going to live to over 150. So it's so, so important that you eat healthy, you exercise, and you be healthy. So that is the most important thing in your life. The next most important thing in life, in life is your partner. Your partner will bring you 99% of your happiness or your unhappiness. Now, if you're not happy with your partner, you've got to get out. You do not stay there. Don't do it. You know, my brother-in-law and, and his wife were married for 37 years before they discovered they'd made a mistake. And they both told each other that they knew after three weeks of marriage that they'd made a mistake. But they stayed together all those years and were unhappy for all those years. You deserve to be happy. The reason we want all the things we want is because we need happiness in our life. And if you find somebody who builds you up, you'll be happy. As soon as you find someone who tears you down, you'll be unhappy. So it's so important to know that there's somebody out there for you who will Will think that you're amazing who will build you up and who will make your life happy so i always say to people if you're in an unhappy relationship get the hell out of there and go and find somebody who will make you happy you know, your family is very, very important. My family are really, really important to me. But you know, not all of your family can make you happy. I had a brother who was an alcoholic who made me very unhappy. And what you've got to do in a situation like that, you've got to cut them loose and let them go, which I did. He found a wonderful woman who looked after him and I got on with my life and I didn't, wasn't paying for his rehab every few months, which I had been doing just before that. Okay. Okay, there's lots of other important things in your life. Shane, if we can have the next slide up there. Your job and your career, it's so important to do something. You Sometimes you just have to have a job that puts food on the table and a roof over your head. But while you've got that job, you've got to be building your career. It's so important that you do something that you're passionate about. I sell irons and toasters and kettles for a living, but my career and what I love doing is empowering women to start their own businesses and to make them successful. So a lot of people come to me and say, will you be my mentor? And I say, yes, I will, but you've got to work as hard as I do. Otherwise, it's not going to work. You've got to understand that if you want to be successful, successful is all about hard work and a lot of it too. So sometimes, and then when your career comes and it, it, you earn more in your career than you do in your job, you leave your job and your career takes over. So money is important. A lot of people don't want to talk about money. They say, oh, money won't buy you happiness. Believe me, it's, I've been rich and I've been poor. It's much better being rich than it is being poor. So um, I can tell you that money does make life, your, your life so much easier. If you're financially independent, you can do what you want. You can make your own choices. So it's really important to make money and not only to make it, but to save it and to look after it because it will look after you at the end of the day. Your aim is to make your money work for you instead of you working for your money. Okay, Shane, the next slide. So it's nice to have beautiful things. I live in beautiful homes. I've got five beautiful homes. I've got two Porsches. I have, um, you'll see that exact watch on my arm. I have everything that my heart desires. And it's not rude to have personal nice goods around you. You will feel better if you've got nice things around you. And you can have nice things around you if you work hard. You can't be sitting watching days of other people's lives and have all these beautiful things. It doesn't work like that. You've got to work hard every single day. Do whatever you need to do to get the job done. The other thing I want to talk to you about is your spiritual life. You know, it doesn't matter if you pray to God, Buddha, Allah, Rama, Krishna, Jehovah. So long as you know there's a greater force out there and that you do good as much as you possibly can. You don't ever do anything bad to anybody and you will, your whole life will change. But you've got to have a spiritual life. You have to know that there's a greater force out there that walks with you every inch of your journey of this life that we're in. But to me, the most important thing is giving back. It's giving back. So you've got to save 10%. So for every 100 rand you earn, save 10 rand, invest 10 rand. Why can I invest 10 rand? Mrs. Hirsch, I can't do that. Well, it's better to invest 10 rand. If you make a mistake, you've only lost 10 rand. If you wait till you've got a million rand, you invest that, you lose it. You've lost a lot. But you've got to give 10 rand back to charity. 
out of every 100 rand. That if you just work on that formula, it works incredibly well. Now you might say, Mr. Hirsch, I can't afford to give anything to charity. I can only afford what I've got. You have to, because by giving to somebody else who's worse off than you, you say to the universe, I have enough. And as soon as you say I have enough, the universe gives you more. And you say, it doesn't, why does it work like that? It says in the Bible, he has much more shall be given. He has little, what little he has should be given, be taken away. And you might say, but that's not fair. And I'll say, well, I never made the rules. I wasn't around when they made those rules, but those are the rules and you have to live by the rules if you want to get ahead. So it's really, really important. So it's never too late to learn. So when I was 60, I did my business degree. When I was 63, I did my honors. I did my post-grad and I eventually did my master's when I was 70. So you're never too old to learn. You're never too old to improve yourself. And I, I encourage every single one of you who's thinking about it to, and I've always, want, I've always wanted to do a degree. I, for all those years, I wished that I had. And then one day I just decided I was gonna do that. So I encourage you all to educate yourselves more than you were educated. I had no money to educate myself at that stage, but now I had the money to educate myself. That's my, my business degree, my honors, my postgrad and my masters, I did within 10 years. If I can do it, you can do it. And rather, do it sooner than later. I'm not saying you've got to wait till you're 70. So I'm going to ask you what you're going to do today to make sure that you live the life of your dreams because everyone wants to eat, but very few are willing to hunt. And you've got to hunt every single day for those uh, to make sure that you get ahead and get what you want. So I thank you for listening to me very much. And now we can open it for questions. And we've got a couple of questions here already. Um, so where can we purchase reusable sanitary pads so that we can able to help those in need? Uh, you can get them from me. They retail at, um, just came and clicks for 300 rand a pack, but our cost is 100 rand a pack. So you can get them from me or from my friend Sue Barnes. Her company is called Subs, S-U-B-Z Pads. You can get them from her directly. But uh, we have them at Hershey's. So if you need any, um, or if you want to go to a school and donate them, you can, or you can come with me and help me donate them as well. Um, we're not going to the schools now this month because they're obviously writing exams and next month they're closed. So we start again in February. So if you want to, you can start. What I like to do is get ladies in, in groups. So for instance, if somebody's in a business and you've got say 20 ladies working there, every month donate your 100 rand and we go out and we give, to, we give a pack. So we start to say grade eight, we'll give to grade eights this month we give to the grade nines next month we give to grade tens the month after and so it goes or we go to different schools and we can give to them there's lots of girls and today the girls are starting their periods when they're about nine so i often even go into junior schools to give out the reusable sanitary pads so that's what we can do and we can help you to do that and to go out and to help the girls with the cooking, Marianne has a cooking school in, um, in Amlazi. We have cooking schools in our stores as well, where we teach people how to cook and how to, to cook and make a living. I have um, Anna the Baker, who has a school. She's had it in Somerset West now. She's moving back to Gauteng in, in January. She's going to be working at my Centurion branch and teaching her lessons there. So you can do that. And I think what I'd like to encourage a lot of you to do is join our online. We have, um, we have on a Monday, I have motivational Mondays at nine o'clock where I get experts in to talk about mental health and, and how you, if you're anxious and you're worried and you're scared and you're frightened, what do you do? How do you cope with it? They help you to do that. On a Tuesday, I have transformational Tuesdays where we take girls who look very ordinary and show them how to make the best of themselves and make themselves look really glamorous. On Wednesdays, I do my um, woman in business. So women who are starting businesses, you learn from other women who already have businesses. How did they start? Where did they start? You know, and I always say you start where you are right now with what you have. So like when Anna came to me, all she had between her and starvation was 30 rand. That's all she had. We counted the cents out of her handbag. We tipped her handbag out. We got those cents out and we started her business. And it worked incredibly well. And today she's a very wealthy woman. So um, it doesn't matter. I mean, I've got people like Memory who came from um, Zimbabwe and all she had between her, she only had her blanket, her passport and three children. And, you know, she could have just, gone and done nothing forever but she and I said to her she's like Mrs Hirsch I can't work what am I going to do and I said to her well you know what you've, you've got children to look after there'll be others take their children and look after them 
Today, she's got 66 children. She charges each of those mothers 2,000 rand a month to look after those children. And she makes herself a fortune. You do the maths. She just bought herself an Avanza and she's got a successful business running. So um, there's so much that you can do just with where you are, with what you have to make sure that your life, that you're living the life that you want to live. And then you can, once you, it, in the beginning, you've got to plow the money back into the business. But once it starts, you'll see it, you'll get stronger and stronger. And from there, you can go on. So, ladies, I don't know um, if there are any other questions that are going to come through. Um, um, I just want to step in and just, uh, just say thank you for such an inspiration and uh, presentation. And thank you for sharing your story with us. Um, you know, it's, it's really great to see uh, your journey and what you've done with the circumstances that have been thrown at you in life. Um, so I'm going to hand over to my team. I think um, we have a few questions going on in the background. Uh, I'll just hand over to Shruti to relay some of those questions to you um, and then just get your response. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Hi, Margaret. I just wanted to say how absolutely inspiring that talk was. Um, so I'm at UCT and I've been really involved in the entrepreneurial scene here, but mm. I find that it's really male dominated on this side. So to hear your journey has been so inspirational, not only from a business point, but it's really, really inspiring to hear about all the things you do to give back. So I just wanted to say that I really, really loved your talk. Um, one of the questions that I've had sent to me was, in retrospect, um, given all the knowledge that you have now, would you have started with your degree or would you have just started like deep end, jump into the business? Um, yeah, I think, well, I had no money to start my degree. I didn't have a choice. You see, I had to earn the money first because uh, to do your master's is expensive. So um, I, I did it as soon as I could afford to do it. I had, I had educated my children I had paid off my bonds I had paid off my motor car and I had the money to do it so I waited until I, I, in my life I only have things when I can afford them I would have loved to have done it sooner I would have loved to go to university straight from school but I couldn't because I couldn't afford it and so then as life goes on I had to pay pay for my house I paid for my businesses I paid for my stores and it was only much later when I got to 60 when I thought well, now I've made it um you know I became businesswoman in South Africa when I was 62 most influential woman in business when I was 64 I thought now I can start doing it and that's when I did it I would say to anybody else don't wait that long um I, I would have done it if you if I had my life over I'd probably started when I was 30 and just started slowly with one subject at a time to to get through but at the time I was so involved in building the business that I didn't think about it but you know I've spoken to UCT before the Entrepreneurs Society and and spoken to a lot of the people there who try and teach entrepreneurs because I always say I did it the other way around you learning the theory first and you'll do the practical later I did the practical first and I'm do, I did the theory later and should I tell you something they're not even close because what they teach you in the books is really not what it's really like in real life. At real life, they can't teach you how to deal with looting, how to deal with staff who steal. They can't teach you how to deal with all the things that you have with people having affairs in the office. And, you know, those sort of things you have to deal with when you're an entrepreneur, you know. You have to deal with people letting you down when you really trusted them so much and they let you down. You know, what do you do? I had a guy who worked for me who was amazing. And he, we actually started Hershey our air conditioning company together and he was fantastic but unfortunately and I can tell you because he was in the, on the front page of the Sunday Times I had to put him in jail for 94 counts of fraud you know so I mean you don't that they can't teach you how to deal with that at school so I, I, when I talk to entrepreneurs I say even if you've got an A for entrepreneurship I can teach you so much more because what I teach you in one week and practically is more than you'll learn in your whole degree when, when you're writing it. And I know because I've done both. So yeah, it's, it's just incredible. And you know how to cope with what life throws at you and just pick yourself up and start running again and as quick as possible because every day that you're not working, you're not earning. And it's really, really important because when you're earning, you put that money away and you get compound interest. And those of you who've done accounting, you know the power of compound interest. So you've got to be earning that money every single day. And you'll see it just accumulates and snowballs once you start. Yeah. Um, Thank yeah, you so, so much, Margaret. I, oh, yeah, Auntie Sorella has a hand up. 
<laughs> okay, so thanks, Margaret. That was just brilliant. I, I tell you, what a story, really. I, I hope that you're uh, writing a book because this is something that needs to needs to be shared on a wider platform. So I'm uh, I'm, I'm I'm just wanting to go a few steps back, and, and I'm wanting to ask. So there are a few people on the on the call today who might be at the point where they have found their purpose, and now they want to get their business started. Uh, how would they go about, you know, going through all those regulatory processes? That's the one thing. And the other, I want to, I'd, I'd just like to know, how do you create a supportive team structure and a team environment in the workplace? How do you go about doing that? Well, you know, there, there's lots of places we can buy school business in a box and you buy, it's, it's, um, it's an online thing and you can just get it and it, it gives you everything. Or you can just go online because today everything's online. To, to register your company, the UIF, everything, it's all online. How to get a VAT number. You literally, you can sit on your computer and you can do it online. The next thing is to create a website because you've got to have a website. You, you need to have that with people. If you go and approach them for business, the first thing they're going to say, where's your website? Show me your website. So you've got to, and there you don't have to pay anybody to do it you can do it yourself you can download it on google you know how to do it you put your website together put it on there and you can be up and running literally this afternoon if you really do it right if you put effort in you can put it all in and you can start running what was the second part of your question um That's, yeah so i'm just wanting to know about this uh you know i i like the fact that you have you've created such a good team uh, environment yeah. a team structure yeah. so how do you how do you actually get to that point is what i'm asking okay so you start and you do it yourself you've got to know every aspect of the business yourself how to buy how to merchandise how to sell how to market how to do the accounting you have to know it yourself and you've got to teach yourself that so you you start slowly with a little bit as i said to you and you just do a little bit and you make it bigger and bigger then you get to the stage where you need somebody to help you so I went out I looked for a lady I found a fabulous lady by the name of Pat Nadu so I was Ellen was out in the truck I was in the office and I needed someone to help me because now I was getting busier so I found Pat Nadu she came past she just had her fourth child she said I need a job I've got to feed these children and I just don't have enough money so I said okay come and work with me and when I tell you it was primitive we were in Amshlanga Rocks Drive in Durban North she lived in a house that didn't have any water or electricity or anything she literally used to keep her chicken under her chair which she would then take home and slaughter and make the curry for supper. I mean, that was literally how primitive we started. And um, so Pat and I started together. So I taught Pat everything that I knew. And then we got busier. And then um, we brought her niece, Rena, came in to help us. And Rena helped us. And then she, we taught her. So now the two of us knew what to do. So it was quicker and easier. We could teach Rena. And then, so then we needed another guy to come and help us because now we were getting busier. So we got her neighbor, and her neighbor was Alvin. And she brought Alvin in. And we taught him everything we knew. And he worked with Alan and he, we taught him. And so it grew. And now we've got like nearly 2,500 people that work with us every single day. But it literally grew one by one by one. So, and you get the team together. Now, I uh, my own team, which is a magnificent team of really strong people who also work with me. They're committed to the cause. They know, they think like I think. They've got the same values. Your team has to have the same values as you. You can't have somebody who is off on a tangent wanting to do their own thing. They've got to have a team that's got the same values as you, that is hardworking like you, that is prepared to put in the hours. You look at Shane, he's here today doing my slides and that he doesn't have to be, you know, he's not going to get overtime for this. He's just doing it because that's part of the job. So, you know, your team must be committed to the cause to that you all on exactly the same page. I always say it's like the geese that all fly in, in, in formation. You have to have the same ideas. So you literally start with one person, you teach them, and then you teach the second person, you teach the third person, and so it goes. And that's the only way to do it. But you always have to lead by example. If I was sitting back, if I'd said, I'm not going to do this talk on, on, at one o'clock on a Saturday, you know, I'm, I'm, I shouldn't be working now. I do actually work all the time. But anyway. But I could have said that. Then they would have also said, well, I'm not going to be working either. But when I said, I'm working, I lead by example. They all said, okay, we'll be on board. Faye organized everything for me. Shane's with me. Glenda will do the, the press release later. We all work together as a team. And that's how you do it because you have to have common goals and common values. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Thank you very much. That's very really useful. Thank you. Uh, Shruti, do you have uh, are there other, other questions? That's fantastic. Yes. I do. Um, one of the questions has to do with the way back at the start of your business. 
So I think um, right now after lootings, I think everybody's trying to, you know, go into business on their own. And the hardest part is the start. So I think I'm just curious to know what encouraged you, because I know you said you started with repairs. So I just want to know what encouraged you to go that route? Was it a trade that you were already in? I'm just curious. Yeah, so my husband, as I told you, never passed his standards at school. And eventually he was 18 and still in standard seven. His father said to him, listen, you're never going to get you on the track. So you may as well go get a job where you work with your hands because you're obviously never going to pass anything else. So he went and got a job where he worked with his hands. He became a refrigeration technician. And that's what I told you. He was an apprentice when I married him and he was still earning 25 rand a week. He qualified the year we got married and he went up to 300 rand a month, which was a fortune to us in those days. We thought, wow, this is incredible. So he did the work. Remember my formula that I said, he did the work and I did the box. So he would go out and fix people's fridges and stoves and washing machines. And I would be in the office um, doing the invoicing, collecting the money and sorting all that out. That to me is the perfect formula for a business where one person does the work. So you sell your skills. If you've got to start a business, people say to me I want to start a business I don't have any money I said that's absolutely fine sell your skills and you see all the businesses that I've showed you today the baker sold her skills she had was skilled in baking a cake and that's what she started with but she kept plowing the money back into the business that's why I said she made the first cake sold it for 60 and what this made two cakes on 120 that's how you do it we went we first started just servicing air conditioners at 45 rand and air conditioners more than that today so don't hold me to that pricing but um and we just alan just went out to service the air conditioners i collected the money and we put that money back into the business and made the business stronger you've got to build a strong foundation for your business so like mary and Wundler, when she started teaching the ladies to cook she would get the ladies and she would teach them to cook and then she would sell her skills and then they would go out and sell, you know, sell the food to the people. And so they'd come in. And never a week goes by that I don't start a business of some kind, like the lady looking after the children. She started with her own three children. She got the neighbor's children. And so she built up slowly. And I think the whole knack is to build up slowly. You know, what you taught is that you go and borrow a lot of money and you start with everything. What is the point? The minute you start making money, you've got to pay back the money you, you've borrowed. So now you're working like crazy. On paper, you're making money, but you haven't got any more in your hand because you're paying it all back. And that's where most people go wrong. So rather start slowly with a little bit, no matter what you start doing. Start slowly with a little bit, but put the profit back into the business, like the lady with the cakes. But more, a bit more, a bit more. And that's how you build up. And you can do it very, very easy with whatever. And you've got to work your passion. I was on a, a webinar yesterday it's with students and they said, is it better to work to do work that's going to bring you money or is it going to be better to work your passion? And I said, you've got to work your passion because whatever you do, you've got to be passionate about what you do. Although I sell appliances, I'm in the people business. I'm passionate about people. And that's why I work with people on a daily basis. And I love what I do. I don't even think that I'm working because I'm working with people all the time. And that's what I love. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. It really does. It speaks to the whole idea of start where you are with what you have. So you use mm -hmm. your skills and you start. And I love that. Yeah. Um, a question that came up in the chat was, uh, what advice would you give to someone who doesn't have much money, but they want to market their business? Okay, well, you're so lucky today with the internet because, I mean, you can market your business. And by the way, marketing has been proved to be more beneficial than anything else, you know, even more beneficial than financing because you can have the best business with the best prices and the best product and everything. But if you don't market it, it's like having a dinner party and forgetting to invite the guests, you, you know, nobody's going to be there. So um, you can, you've got to market your business really, really well. And that's what I said to you. You can start, you can start your own web page today. You can do an online store today. Day, and you can do it all yourself you can just google how to do it it'll tell you and then you've got to get it out there and you literally put it out to everybody you know and ask them to share it with everybody they know and something as simple as putting an advert on your status on whatsapp it'll just go out to everybody you know they will come to you but then when they do come to you, you say do me a favor put it out on your status and it'll go through they say most people have about 250 people that they deal with on their phone Okay, 
I, by the way, have over 20,000, but that's another story. So if you've got 250 people and you put it out to 250 people and they put it out to 250 people, I mean, already you're just going out and out and out. And those people will know. And out of those, probably only one to 2% will come back to you. But if you keep on putting it out there, putting it out there, those one and 2% will add up to a lot at the end of the day. So yes, you've got to market it. You've got to have a website. You've got to put it on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter. There's so many platforms that are free. You don't even have to pay for. I mean, when I think in the old days with paying for the newspaper, paying for magazines, paying to put it on, you know, the movies, we used to pay such a fortune, which we don't today because you can put it all out on Facebook Marketplace. And I mean, we still advertise on Facebook Marketplace and we do incredibly well from there. Thank you, Margaret. Um, I'm going to ask Jay Sheila to please unmute herself because she has her hand up. Okay. Hi, Margaret. This is really an inspirational talk. Um, it's awesome. I think my question was kind of answered because I was looking at how do we start a business without any cash? But also I wanted to point out more of a comment, but I would like to know from you, Margaret, you know, at the start, it's always about breaking barriers and people are not motivated enough or feel they're not good enough uh, yeah. to be able to uh, take that risk and move on uh, from a job or uh, to start yeah. their own business. How do you motivate yourself and how can we break those barriers when people are so despondent? Well, you know, the first thing is you only get despondent and depressed when you're thinking about yourself. You've got to think about other people. So the first thing I say to people is go out and see who you can help. And they say, well, I have, Margaret, I haven't got any money to help anybody else. Well, you've got time. So I'll give, give you, for instance, my friend whose name is Jenny Gort. She's a, a jeweler. You see my beautiful Swarovski jewelry. She makes it. She's a, she makes Swarovski jewelry. Very, very nice. But of course, when COVID hit, nobody was wearing wearing jewelry and nobody's buying her jewelry so what's she going to do but her neighbor was an old lady and the old lady said to her jenny do me a favor when you go to the shop would you please just pick up my medicine for me so she said sure she went she picked up the lady's medicine she came back the lady gave her a 500 grand tip and she said oh my goodness that is just incredible i was doing it for you as a favor and the lady said i'm happy to pay you so with that she asked the other lady down the road she was an old lady as well she said look i'm going out shopping do you need me to buy anything for you and she said i'm so relieved that you asked me because i don't want to go out i'm scared of the COVID. i'm old bloody bee. so she started anyway long story short she started this business where she would go and buy stuff for people and deliver it to their homes and she had this roaring business that her husband joined her, her son joined her they were all in this business together so it just goes to show you don't have to start with anything she started with nothing they were stuck at home with COVID. they had nothing and she just started helping somebody else. And from that, her business grew. So whatever you want to do, just find somebody who needs that, you know, and then you can just start with where you are with what you have right now today. And if you start, once you start, you know, the hardest part of a journey is the first step. Once you've taken that first step, the second step is there. You take the second step, then the third, then the fourth, and you just keep going. And that's exactly how it works. And with that, we've only got two minutes left. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you, Margaret. I think I just want to take one last question um, from the chat. Um, yes. And Malcolm asks, um, he wants to know how to get access to finance for a startup business, if you have any thoughts. Okay. Well, my answer to that is don't. Because the minute that you have finance, the minute somebody finances you, you end up working for them. You're not working for yourself. So it depends. Some people just want to work for somebody else their whole life, but you can work for yourself and make a living. If you can work for a boss and make a living, you work for yourself, you can make a fortune. So I was working for a boss who was horrible to me. He used to pay me a little bit of money and it was a dreadful situation. I work for myself now and I have absolutely everything that I want. So my advice is don't borrow money, don't get finance. Do exactly what I've been telling you the whole time. Start where you are with what you have today. Even if you have to tip your purse out, tip your handbag out, um, Three months ago, I started a girl in a business. She only had 70 rand left in her handbag. And we started making um, fit cook, which she sold on the side of the road. And the first month she made 2,000 rand. The second month she made 5,000 rand. This is her third month. She just made 10,000 rand. Net profit, tax-free, selling a fit cook on the side of the road. You don't go and borrow money. The worst thing you can do is to borrow money. If you borrow money, you've got to pay it back with interest. The money you make will never, ever cover that 
Uh, I know they tell you in the books it does. I know they tell you in the movies it does. And everybody who helps you wants to finance you, but you end up working for them. You're not working for yourself at the end of the day. So my advice is never borrow or lend a bee. Just work today with what you have right now. And that's how you make it work. Plow it back into the business and you'll always do incredibly well. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much, Margaret. And thank you for answering everybody's questions. I think um, it's it's been great. Um, I just, uh, I would now like to hand over to Sunita Basant, who is our project coordinator of the Arya Samaj Women's Forum um, to pass the vote of thanks. Um, Sunita, over to you. Hi, thank you, uh, Mikara. On behalf of the Arya Samaj Women's Forum, we'd like to express our sincere gratitude to Mrs. Margaret Hush for accepting our invitation to present at this webinar. It's been insightful and no doubt many women will start off their business ventures. Thank you for making the time to be with us, Margaret. Advertising uh, an event is key to success. For this, we extend our gratitude to the Arya Samaj administration, Radio Hindwani, independent newspapers, SABC, and to all of those of you who have shared the invitation on social media. We'd like to acknowledge the contribution of the ladies of the Arya Samaj Women's Forum Executive, in particular, Mrs. Rita Vedalankar, Mrs. Deepika DeCosta, Ms. Uh, Mikara Miraj, Ms. Shruti Zaulak, and we would, who have worked together to ensure the success of this event. We also have Sadhana and Divya Ramkalas, who have managed the technical aspects of today's event. Thanks to you, the audience, for making the, the time to enhance our, uh, your knowledge and to getting your business started. Best wishes as you begin your journey. Before you leave this meeting, please can you complete the webinar evaluation that's on the screen shortly. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. That was really fantastic. And I would like to ask if, if the uh, Arya Samaj Women's Forum can actually partner with you on some of your initiatives. I think we would really, it, we, we would really enjoy working with you. So if that's okay, and we can be in contact. Thank you so much. I'd be happy to do that anytime. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you very much and have a pleasant afternoon. And to the audience, thank you very much for joining us. And until our next event in 2022, goodbye, best of luck and have a, have a fantastic festive season. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, girls. Thank you so much. Thank you also for my flowers and my cake. <laughs> Glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> All right, then. Thank you. Bye. Do we have the poll results? Oh, there we go. Um, can you put the poll up, Sadna? Okay, awesome. Thank you very much. All right.